Good evening. Welcome back. Always hate to interrupt good conversation. That means good things are happening. Uh, just want to welcome you back to our conversation with John Hopper, who's written a fascinating new book, new book called Questioning God, and it goes, delves through the 15 questions that are most commonly asked, uh, as far as we know, about God, faith, and the Bible. And uh, we want to make sure we maximize that time. So why don't we delve right in? All right. So, um, you know, I just want to restate that no matter where we are uh, in our spiritual faith, our spiritual formation, it's, they, these are important questions for any of us to um, dive into intellectually, emotionally, certainly spiritually. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I think so. So, I mean, I think a lot of times the questions that, are, that we've been talking about are the questions that are they're, they're sort of stumbling blocks for people, mm -hmm. you know. So either they don't believe because of these questions that they've never really gotten answered, or their faith is kind of stymied, mm -hmm. right? So they, they're kind of stuck because they haven't gotten answered. So I think it's important to engage them. Yeah, that yeah. stuckness can happen to yeah, any yeah, of us yeah, at right. any time. Absolutely. So Yeah, so these are important. So we'll go right into our first question for tonight, and it's this. If God is real, John, then why is there so much evil and suffering? I mean, this is the doozy. Mm. I mean, this is the one that I believe gets asked the most, uh, yeah. certainly in yeah, my experience. Yeah. yeah. And when I heard the news of what happened in Uvalde, right, um, my, kind of my stomach sank that we would be talking about this tonight. Yeah, me so, too. Um, so, I, and this morning when I'm driving uh, around and passing elementary schools, I just, I couldn't even imagine taking my kid to an elementary school this morning, right? Like, you wrap your so, brain around it. Yeah, I mean, just so, um, so I, I think it's really important to say kind of right up front that um, if I was in Uvalde, for example, today right now, and, and a parent, you know, just in their anguish, ask me the question, you know, where's God, or why would God allow this, um, I would not answer them. Mm. So, um, because it's not the time to answer them, right? So, it's time to love them. Right, so, yeah. And uh, so, I, I, I say that, um, that's really a very key upfront mm -hmm. thing to say, because... Um, so oftentimes when people are asking this question about where is God or why would God allow this, um, we're, we're quick to sort of defend God. Well, the reason God did this or, right. well, you should believe in God anyway sort of thing. And, and what we really need to do is we need to get to a place where we're hearing people's stories mm -hmm. because um, many times the question is being asked because there's been some personal pain and suffering, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're asking it not really because they s sit around at night thinking, I wonder philosophically how it's possible for there to be a good and loving God and for there to be evil and suffering in the world, right? Mm -hmm. they're, right. they're asking that question because they're hurting. Absolutely. And they've hurt, right? So, and, and many times they're just seeing if we care. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of times where I've been talking to people and they've asked this question, and in response, I've said, now, are you just asking this question sort of out of curiosity? Hmm. Or are you asking this question because there's just been some really hard things that have come along in life? And almost every single time, they say the second. Mm -hmm. And they begin to share with me a story. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we never even get back to the question. Because that's not really what they're interested in. They're interested in, 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 in sharing their hurt and seeing whether I would care about it. So, so... I'll share with you some things tonight about sort of how we might answer this question, but um, I just, I want to say that up front because mm -hmm. if anybody asks you this question, I think that should be your first response. Mm -hmm. Your first response shouldn't be to try to explain to them how it's possible that there's yeah. a God who would allow evil and suffering. So. Well, and I really appreciate you saying this because we're all in a state of shock. Yeah. Uh, you know, right now it's, it's, it's certainly affecting any, of, any and all of us. Mm -hmm. Um, but this question about mm -hmm. suffering, I mean, it, yeah. it, all the major world religions, mm -hmm. you know, have some mm -hmm. take on this, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah. And yeah, because it doesn't really matter what you believe, even if you're an atheist, 
You still have to deal with evil and suffering. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, if I'm this or that, I don't have to deal with evil and suffering. You still have to deal with it, right? So, um, so you have to have some way to explain it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, well, um, I think really sort of the first sort of issue that I would talk about in regards to this question is, is whether it's even logical to believe in an all-powerful, all-loving God and for there to be evil and suffering. Because I think many people think, well, if God's all-loving, he wouldn't want things to happen mm -hmm. that are evil and s full of pain. And if God is all-powerful, then he could stop it. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that if there's evil and suffering, he's either not all-loving or he's not all-powerful, right? right? So they seem to like not go together. So you get the logic of the right, question right. and so why it's logic, asked so frequently. Right, that's right. Yeah. But I think that that's not, that there's, it's not necessarily illogical to think mm -hmm. that God could be all loving and all powerful and yet still allow there to be evil and suffering. And I'll just kind of share with you a couple of reasons why. So, so first of all, um, uh, I think um, it's important to see that, um, that without a God, um, we're sort of left in a place where it's, it's hard for us to call things unjust, okay? So it's not really suffering that we have a problem with, mm -hmm. okay? It's, it's unjust suffering. Mm -hmm. So if, if your friend, you know, gets angry and you know, kicks the curb or something like that and breaks his toe, like, you know, maybe there's a little bit of sympathy, but not really <laughs> got what he deserved, right? Sort of deal. That kind of suffering we don't have a problem with, like, Mm -hmm. Dummy, you know, kick a curb, right? Okay, but but when we see something, okay, like the pain and suffering that's coming out of Uvalde right now, mm -hmm. right? We go, well, where's the justice in that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's unjust suffering that we have a problem with. But if you and I are um, just creatures that have the, sort of the cosmos has spit out, mm -hmm. then then really we're just survival of the fittest creatures, mm -hmm. right? So. One bigger creature creates pain to a, so other creatures until other, another sort of a band of creatures or a bigger creature sort of deals with that, right? And that's it. There isn't really any justice or injustice. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of, sort of survival of the fittest. And so for us to even call something just or unjust, mm -hmm. there has to be a God who says that's not right or that's not you're not good. Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the stories I love to tell is of Andrea Dilly. Andrea Dilly grew up in in Kenya. She was a, a daughter of a of a missionary, a, a medical missionary, and she would frequent with her father to um, uh, the medical clinic there. Mm -hmm. And she would go in maybe three times a week, and she would see children who were you know, malnutrition mm -hmm. there, and they were sick, and that kind of thing, and then she'd go a couple of days later, and they would have died, mm. okay? And so, by her teenage years, she had given up on God, right? So, um, but then she changed her thinking, because she realized that if there is no God, and we're just survival of the fittest creatures, then, well, some people are gonna be fit and live, and some people aren't, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to read to you, in fact, a quote from her that I just think is really powerful. She, uh, she said, when people ask me what drove me out the doors of the church and then what brought me back, my answer to both questions is the same. I left the church in part because I was mad at God about human suffering and injustice. And I came back to the church because of that same struggle. Hmm. I realized that I couldn't even talk about justice without standing inside of a theistic framework, that is, without believing mm -hmm. in God. In a naturalistic worldview, where it's a, a worldview where we only believe that nature's involved, mm -hmm. there is no God, right. right? A parentless orphan in the slums of Nairobi can only be explained in terms of survival of the fittest. We're all just animals slumming in, in a godless world fighting for space and resources. The idea of justice doesn't really mean anything. To talk about justice, you have to talk about objective morality. And to talk about objective morality, you have to talk about God. So the whole idea of justice in the first place is a, is a godly thing. Yeah. 
So I think, you know, we might say that it's sort of inconsistent, right? So we might say that it's inconsistent to uh, sort of believe that there's a, sort of a God out there if there's evil and suffering. But we really couldn't call any evil and suffering, evil and suffering unjust unless there was mm -hmm. a God. So. Mm -hmm. Now, the second reason why I think it's probably not right to think about uh, evil and suffering as being inconsistent with, a, with an all-powerful and all-loving God is because sometimes we have the power and the love, even, too, mm -hmm. to not want to see pain come upon somebody, okay? But we let it happen anyway. Mm -hmm. And probably the sort of the biggest example of that would be, say, our, our child sort of needs certain medical care, or maybe we're taking them in for a six-month polio shot, right, mm -hmm. or something like that. We know in advance that they're going to feel pain. And, and we didn't wake up in the morning saying, ah, oh, today is the day I get to inflict pain on my child. I mean, we love our ch child. We're, we're not interested in them having pain, right? So, yeah. again, we didn't have to take them there, but we did because of overriding reasons, right? right? So, so, if we, as those who have the power in certain situations and the love that wouldn't want to see pain on people still allow it to happen at times, mm -hmm. it would seem to me that God could do that as well. Yeah, I mean, we're not... Is this on? We're, we're not sadistic parents yeah. any more than God is that's a sadistic right. God. Yeah. He's yeah. a God of love. That's how he describes himself. That's right. Yeah. 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 I, I can remember when my son Caleb was two and a half and he ran into a glass coffee table and we had to go to the ER and he had to get stitched up right by his eye and I remember that look on his face like you know why are you allowing this to happen yeah. you know but, but we had yeah. to do that right. for him to get completely that's healed, right, which, right. which took place. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, people might say, well, what, what overriding reasons would God have, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we look at the situation in Uvalde, and you say, well, what overriding reasons would God have for, for that evil and suffering? So, uh, so I'll share with you some reasons why God might allow evil and suffering, but here's what I, I want you to understand is that... Um, while well, I'll share with you some reasons, in any given situation, I probably wouldn't know what reason would apply, okay? Now, God might tell us in some situation what the reason was, but a lot of times we don't know the reason, but he does still give reasons, mm -hmm. okay, that might apply. So, um, so um, one of the reasons, for example, that's often said by Christians, well, it's to build character, right? Okay, so, and that's true, right? I mean, we need some pain and suffering to build character, but if someone dies, they're not building any character, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there has to be some other reasons as, as well. Mm -hmm. so, um, so let's just kind of just explore a, a few of those reasons here. So I think the first big reason is that I think that evil and suffering is the risk that God was willing to take in order to have real relationship with us. So God could have made us, right, so that we were just sort of in lockstep to everything he wanted us to do. Robotic. Robotic even, yeah. but, you know, what would that, you know, would that really be a love relationship? So I, I brought a little doll with me today, so I actually, you're probably wondering, well, what is this up here? <laughs> so I do have one doll, right, so, um, so this is, this little guy's called the Mr. Wonderful doll here, right, and, uh, Mr. Wonderful, he, uh, he's called Mr. Wonderful because apparently he says things that women really like to hear, okay? So, so let's, let's hear a few things I need that, this doll. Uh, that uh, Mr. Wonderful said. I love you. Yes, dear. You've been on my mind all day. That's why I bought you these flowers. You know, honey, why don't you just relax and let me make dinner tonight? Why don't we go to the mall? <laughs> the ball game really isn't that important. I'd rather spend time with you. So, so he, you know, he says all kinds of things that apparently women would love to hear, right? So he's called the Mr. Wonderful doll. And, and why, while women may like to hear those things, 
I doubt there's really any woman who would be satisfied with the Mr. Wonderful doll. Because Mr. Wonderful is programmed to say those things. He can't say anything but those things, right? Mm -hmm. So you couldn't really have a loving relationship with a Mr. Wonderful doll, right? Mm -hmm. So what we want is to hear those kinds of things freely given, right? But of course, if we're free to share those things, that means there's the potential not to say those things, right? So if we're free to walk in the way that God would have us walk, and to love others and to love him, mm -hmm. that means we also have the capacity not to do that. And that's where evil and suffering really comes in, mm -hmm. in many regards. So, um, so why would God allow evil and suffering? And I would say, because it was the risk of real relationship. That's, mm -hmm. that's what he wanted, so. Is this headset still working? It is? A Oh, with his, okay, sorry. So um, another reason why I think God would allow evil and suffering is because um, it alerts us to the fact that something's not right. Mm. So uh, if you just happen to stick your hand sort of on the kitchen counter and all of a sudden it starts to get really hot, right, because you actually stuck your hand over the stove, it's good that you feel that pain mm -hmm. because if you didn't feel that pain, your hand would just be finished. Right? Right. So it alerts you to the fact that something isn't right and so you attend to the matter, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the examples I use in the book is of leprosy. So leprosy is often thought of as a skin disease. It's really a nerve disease. Mm. So people don't feel themselves getting burnt. They don't feel themselves getting cut, right? They bump themselves in the middle of the night. They don't know it, so they don't attend to it. Mm. And then infection gets in, and ultimately they begin to lose appendages, yeah, right? It's, it's insidious That's that right. way. So would yeah. you say, is it good to feel pain? Mm -hmm. And the answer would be yes, because it alerts them to the fact that something's not right. Mm -hmm. And so... In many ways, the pain and suffering that we experience in the world, I think, is God's way of alerting us to the fact that something's not right. Mm -hmm. Something has gone haywire here. Mm -hmm. So, um, in fact, right, C.S. Lewis says that, you know, pain is God's megaphone to arouse a deaf world, mm -hmm. right? So, we, we're not hearing him anymore. That's, that's not something that's not good. So, pain and suffering alerts us to, the, uh, to that fact. So. But God's doing even more than that. I mean, mm. he's doing more than just sending us mm. signals from the mountaintop and yeah. so forth, or even through our wiring or how our bodies are built. I mean, mm. what makes Christianity unique, I mm. think, is that it's the one religion where the, the hero of that religion mm. comes down That's right. and walks in yeah. our pain. That's with, right. I mean, he's, That's right. So he's not a far-off God who just sort of knows of our... A sort of pain and suffering like sort of book knowledge. Mm -hmm. He's a God who knows our pain and suffering by personal experience, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so God himself is, has put himself in that place, which means that even if we don't understand the reasons why God would allow mm -hmm. suffering, we still have someone who can empathize mm -hmm. and sympathize with us, right? So mm -hmm. he's still, he's worthy to turn to. So, um, and I think that's remarkable. If, again, so if, as we said earlier, um, every belief system has to deal with pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't believe in God at all, then when things like in Uvalde happen, there's no justice, really, because the guy who committed the crimes, if there's, if there's nothing after this life, he's feeling no remorse right now. Mm -hmm. There's no judgment for what he's done at all, mm -hmm. right. okay? And for those who were taken, there's no hope. Mm -hmm. There's no righting of wrongs. Mm -hmm. And the Christian story says that, yes, there's pain and suffering, but there's, there's a hope mm -hmm. and there's justice that mm -hmm. will be meted out in the end. And in the process, we have one who can sympathize mm -hmm. with us that we can we can turn to. I think you yeah. just explained why it's important for the God we worship to be a God of love and justice. Mm -hmm. We want to worship a God That's right. who manifests both. That's right, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, 
Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot more, obviously, we could say on sort of uh, pain and suffering and the reasons why God would allow it. But you'll have to look at the chapter in the book because <laughs> we only have so much time. So, yeah. Okay. So, let's, uh, let's go to a sort of similar question. So, there's so many religions out there, okay. so many belief systems out there. Um, let's talk about that, the exclusivity clause. Yeah. You know, why, yeah. Why do Christians... You know, why, why do we say that it's the only way? Yeah. Well, and I think really this is the concern that a lot of people have, right? Mm -hmm. So if Christianity was just presenting itself as a way and, and everybody, that's everybody it. Everybody be cool right. with that. Everybody would probably be all right with that. Yeah. Well, that's your way. I got my way. Yeah, everybody's good, right? So, mm -hmm. um, but it's this idea that it's the only way, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, I, and first of all, here's some reasons why I think that bothers people. I mean, first of all, I think it bothers people because um, people don't like exclusive claims, and particularly in this day and age, and for good reason, right? Because there have been exclusive claims that have been made in the past that just aren't right, okay? So that have excluded certain peoples, right? Mm -hmm. So if we say, well, women can't do that, right? So mm -hmm. or black people can't do that, right? right. That's, those are exclusive statements, right? And they're just plain wrong. Yeah. And so people, they don't want to be associated with something that might be exclusive, mm -hmm. all right? But we have to recognize is that even though it is wrong to be exclusive when what's right is not exclusive, there are some things that are exclusive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, so when I was a little kid and I grew up in California and my family would go to Disneyland and there are certain rides I couldn't ride <laughs> because I wasn't tall enough. So those rides were exclusive to taller people, to taller, height advantaged people, right? And I, Sorry and about I wasn't, that. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't meeting the bar, right? So, but, but that exclusivity was for my safety, mm -hmm. right? So because the ride wasn't designed for people that mm -hmm. were shorter. So um, we only put unleaded gasoline into our cars, and now we put electric into our cars too. So, mm -hmm. and so you might say, well, that's just so exclusive. I'm going to put, you know diesel engine or diesel fuel into it or leaded fuel and well it would be dumb right because right. the engine only works off of unleaded fuel right mm -hmm. so so there's a lot of things that like we want them to be exclusive like I, I want only doctors that have been to medical school and have gotten their license and been trained I don't want anybody just putting up their shingle anywhere right like there should be some exclusivity to that so um, so there are some things that are exclusive and we have to recognize that if you get bitten by a snake and in fact I I know of a fellow here in Houston just a couple weeks ago he's in California he went hiking he got bit by a rattlesnake he was a couple hours away from a hospital Wow! so it looked like he was gonna lose a limb at least mm -hmm. okay he didn't which was great so um, but when he gets to the hospital he didn't say just give me any old anti-venom it doesn't really matter <laughs> No, I want you, you to be really exclusive and just give me the rattlesnake anti-venom. That's what I want you to give me, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there are some things that are just exclusive. So, and we have to recognize that. So, it's not things aren't bad just because they're exclusive. Mm -hmm. So, and so when we look at the sort of the claims of Christianity, we shouldn't dismiss it right off the bat just because it's exclusive. I think some people also dismiss sort of this idea that Christianity is the on, only way because. They said, well, all, people of all different faiths are also sincere, mm, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I get that, right? I mean, I think this question has become a much bigger question because um, we're not a monolithic society anymore, mm -hmm. right? right? So we're a pluralistic society. And we work, so. we work with and we live by and we play with people of many different faith backgrounds, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and we see their sincerity. Mm -hmm. So to say, think that, well, they're out and that just doesn't seem to be right. Mm -hmm. But what we have to recognize is that sincerity is not a very good measure of truth. Mm -hmm. Sincerity is great. We want people to be sincere. Mm -hmm. But just because someone's sincere doesn't mean that what they're doing is right or good. So, I mean, one of the funniest examples is Jim Marshall. He played for the Minnesota Vikings from sort of the 60s through the 80s. And played tons and tons of games. He, I think when he finished his career, he played more games than anybody else. One of the, one of the great players one of, of the all great time. Players, yeah, yeah, great players. And he picked up a ball in one game, and he ran the wrong direction. And he gets, you know, to the end zone, and he throws the ball up into the stands, and he's cheering he'd gone the wrong way. 
So he was remarkably sincere, right? <laughs> so, but he was sincerely wrong, and it cost him to his team. Right? Yeah. So, so, um, or the more tragic example of that is in uh, Bellevue, Bellevue, Bellevue. Well, I'm not sure. Belleville, maybe, Ohio, in the early 2000s, there was a nursing home, and tanks were mismarked. And the nurses thought they were hooking up oxygen, and instead it was nitrogen, and it killed four patients. Mm. And six other patients got very ill before it was sort of figured out what was going on. Now, were the nurses sincere? Yes, but they weren't right, okay? Mm -hmm. so, um, so there's a great quote um, it's along these lines where it says, Sincerity is sort of not a measure mm -hmm. of truth, right? Mm -hmm. We need to measure sincerity against sincerity and truth against truth, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. because people can be sincerely wrong. So right. they're just two different measures. Um, so John, those bumper stickers that I think yeah. everybody's seen that yeah, yeah. say coexist yeah, yeah. and they're right. that's yeah. formed in the symbols sure, of yeah. Yeah. world religions yeah. and so forth. Um, the reality is though that all world mm -hmm. religions think differently than each other. That's right. I mean, That's they right. all have their own, yeah. even exclusive claims, sure. different sure. Yeah. ideas, Absolutely. different concepts. Yeah. How would now, you I, I would hope, for example, that we could coexist. Right? Yeah, so, sure. So, in a pluralistic um, society. In a pluralistic society. Absolutely. Like I would hope we're not killing each other or, you know, whatever the case might be. So I would hope that we could coexist too. But if, if we think we're going to coexist because people actually believe the same things, mm -hmm. I think we have it wrong. So, so sometimes people think, well, all religions really believe the same things. And then a few of you Christians over here are saying that you know, you're the only way sort of deal. You haven't really examined the other religions then. Mm -hmm. Because the other religions, they believe that their way is the right way too. Sincerely. Sincerely. Yeah. So you can put a Muslim and a Jew next together. You can have a hard time making them believe that they actually think the same thing, mm -hmm. okay? So Muslims are in the Quran, for example. The Quran says that if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, you are destined to hell and will never get out. Well, that's an exclusive claim there. Right? Absolutely. So it's completely the opposite of, of Christianity, right? So, um, so all the religious religions make sort of exclusive claims. So my, my search colleague in Southern California, he put together this event where there's a panel of different religious mm -hmm. leaders. Mm -hmm. And uh, they each had a certain amount of time to sort of share the main tenets of their beliefs. And then my friend, he asked the crowd that was there, he said, so based on what you've heard, would you say that all the religions believe the same thing? And the crowd was like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because we've sort of been conditioned to sort of, well, yeah, really all the religions, they really believe the same things. And the religious leaders started to laugh. And he said, what are you laughing about? He said, we don't believe the same thing. I don't believe what he believes. He doesn't believe what I believe. Um, they're making exclusive, exclusive claims. So it's not just Christianity. It's, right. it's, it's other religious faiths as well. So. So, even, so even to a Muslim in that situation, that would be offensive or you that's know, right because yeah. you're not really listening not to really what listening I'm saying to me that's right yeah. that's right yeah. you're you're sort of minimizing the differences when they're significant right so, yeah um, so that leaves us still with the question of well why Christianity right mm -hmm. uh, sort of among the religions and, and and it really has comes down to the claims of Jesus and the person of Jesus so Jesus himself was the one who said that he's the only way, mm -hmm. right? So that he's who we're to look at. And he does that through some different statements, but he does it very powerfully through this one illustration that I want to share. So you're familiar with John 3.16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him might have eternal life, right? So, but the verses right before that are this illustration. In John 3, 14 and 15, it says that just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, mm -hmm. so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him might mm -hmm. uh, have eternal life. So what's he talking about, Moses and the snake in the desert, right? So if we go back to the book of Numbers, we see that when no Moses was bringing the people towards the promised land, and they're in the wilderness, they're grumbling and grumbling against God. So God sends all these snakes. The people are dying, right? So, 
And then they call out to Moses. They say, Moses, you got to do something because we're all going to die. Talk to God. So God says, okay, Moses, what I want you to do is I want you to make this bronze pole with a bronze snake around it, and anybody gets bitten at it, if they're willing to go look at it, they'll be saved. Mm -hmm. Now imagine if you're in, a, you're in that scene there, and these snakes are just coming out of the woodwork. They're just everywhere. And so you run into your tent. Okay, well, you know, I don't know how good that's going to do. And sort of, it's not like they had these sort of seal-proof tents in those days, right? Eventually, mm -hmm. the, the snakes get in. And they bite you, and they bite your family. Mm -hmm. And you're like, man, what do I do now? And then suppose that your neighbor runs by and says, did you hear? Did you hear? I know, hear what? Well, God, God and Moses, they talked, and God said to Moses to make this you know, bronze snake on a pole, and that if you get bitten and you go look at it, you'll be saved. There's a way out. There's a way out, right? Yeah. So uh, let's say you're in the tent, and you go, well, thanks for letting me know that, but... Um, um, I think I can handle this myself. Or um, I'll, I'll, sign a, I'll sign a piece of paper that says I believe that. But you stay in the tent, mm -hmm. like, you're still in trouble, right? If you say bronze, bronze pole, like there's only one pole. Like, I, I'm not really into bronze, like silver or gold maybe, but you know. I'm a gold bronze. man. I'm a gold man. Yeah. No, there's only one pole you can look at. Mm -hmm. That's it. If you don't look at that pole, you're going to die. So Jesus used that illustration, right? Because he wanted people to understand there's only one pole to look at. And he called himself that pole. Like, I'm the one to be lifted up. Mm -hmm. And you've all been bitten by a snake. Mm -hmm. And the question is, are you willing to look at that pole, right? So the reason that Christians say that Jesus is the only way is because Jesus said that. Now, anybody can say that, though, right? So what's really important then is, well, how did Jesus sort of authenticate his claims. Mm. And we touched on that a little bit when we talked about sort of the, sort of the veracity of the Bible, the miracles, right? So mm -hmm. I think Jesus' miracles help to sort of authenticate mm -hmm. his claims. I think his fulfilled prophecy sort of mm -hmm. helps to authenticate his claims. I think the way he treated people mm -hmm. authenticates his claims. So, um, uh, and then I think in the end, too, what's really sort of incredible about Jesus is that um, he didn't just tell us of a way, mm -hmm. he made himself the way through his own sacrificial offer, right? right. So, um, so why do Christians say that Jesus is the only way? Because he said it and because he authenticated it, right? Mm -hmm. So he was either lying, as we've, many of you have heard, which doesn't seem to make sense the way he treated people and the way he care for people. He was a lunatic, right? That didn't seem to fit. He always seemed a very sound mind. Sort of mm -hmm. deal. Or he was the Lord. Mm -hmm. He is who he said he was. So, um, so I think that's why even amidst all these different religions, uh, you know, Christians historically have said there's only one pole to look at and it's Jesus. It's not because they want to leave people out. Mm -hmm. It's because if there is only one way, there's only one way. So I grew up in Central California, go up to the mountains all the time, and you know, there's some communities, there's one road out of that community. And there's been a lot of forest fires there, right? And you know, a person could say, well, I'm not gonna take that road, I'm gonna try to find some other way. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna work well for them. There's one road out, that's it, mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of right. thing. So um, it might be exclusive, but it's life-giving too. So. Yeah. Um, in a way, there's, it's, it's, it's a good thing, right, so that there's this way that people can get out. And I think Jesus provides that for us. You know, in addition to all the ways you were talking about that Jesus authenticates mm -hmm. it and the Bible mm -hmm. authenticates it and the miracles mm -hmm. and so forth, I think most people, non-Christians alike, mm -hmm. people of other religions, I don't see anybody saying that Jesus was a braggadocious mm -hmm. character. Yeah. You know, yeah. so for him to put mm. a stake in the ground, so yeah. to speak, to say that he yeah. is the way, the truth, yeah. and life. Nobody comes to the Father mm -hmm. through him. And for him to also say in Scripture that if you don't believe in me, that you're going to perish in your mm. own sins. Mm. You know, yeah. I mean, that's, that's not a, that's an audacious It's a very thing audacious say. claim, that's right. And I think, you know, what you said about that Jesus wasn't braggadocious, what's so interesting through the gospel is how often Jesus told people to keep things quiet. Mm, true. Right? Like if, if this was like, hey, I'm God and I want everybody to believe in me, and so you would think he would announce that to all if it was just a power play, right? Yeah. 
but in many times he was telling he, people to kind of keep it quiet. Yeah, so, he wasn't. Which is another question. We looking talk for about, so. political yeah. power or anything right. like that. Yeah. So um, those extra biblical historical accounts that exist, uh, mm -hmm. we've talked about kind yeah. of around that a little right. bit, but, you know, that we have from other sources. Mm -hmm. um, it's really amazing what they said, right. you know, about uh, this whole idea, uh, you know, what we haven't talked about yet is the, the options of, you know, if Jesus makes mm -hmm. this claim, mm -hmm. you know, that I am the yeah. way, the truth, and life, nobody comes to the Father mm -hmm. except through me, yep. well, then we have to evaluate That's right. what he's saying. Mm -hmm. is, is, is it true? Mm -hmm. Is it some other option? That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's the Lord liar lunatic sort exactly. of option, right? So either he is who he said he was. He's either lying because he knew, you know, that he, that he wasn't the way, but he was just trying to sort of go after some other means, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, he's not a good man, right? He's not a good teacher. He's a wicked person, right? So, or he's a lunatic. You know, he just kind of thinks that he's God and he's mm -hmm. not, right? But, but lunatics, they've always got something else going on with them that makes you go... Guys, they're a little bit strange there, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, Jesus is never described that way in he's the history books. Right? A sound so person. He's a very sound person. Wise. So that's right. All those types yeah. of things. Um, okay, so maybe there's some people listening to us, and they, they think, uh, well, John, maybe you've forgotten a category. Hmm. Uh, maybe this is maybe this is all made up. Maybe Jesus sure. Um, sure. wasn't even a real guy. Mm -hmm. That's right. So you could say, Lord, liar, lunatic, or legend. Right? Mm. So this is just something that was made up. And mm. that sort of goes back to what we talked about last week in regards to the historical veracity of the scriptures. So, and I think there's a lot of reasons to believe that the historical account that we have is correct, mm -hmm. right? So, because not only do we have sort of the four biblical accounts, all right, mm -hmm. but we have all this extra biblical a discussion of Jesus by people who are hostile to Christianity, yet they still speak of Jesus doing miracles. They still speak of Jesus um, being a wise teacher. They still speak of Jesus uh, uh, sort of being called the Messiah, right? They still speak of those things, and they're, they're not even, they're not interested in Christianity. They may even be persecuting right. Christians, and they t speak about those things. Well, and they verify right. that he was an historical person, That's that right. he was crucified. Exactly. You know, a lot yeah. of things that are central to, to yeah. what we believe. Um, okay, well, let's switch to this question. Uh, it kind of dovetails off what we've been talking about, this exclusivity part. So what happens to people that have never heard of Jesus, mm. you know? Okay, he's the way, the truth, the life, but what if they've never heard that? Yeah, yeah. Then what? So, first of all, I love it when people ask this question because to me, they've sort of understood Christianity if they're asking that question. Mm. In other words, if they think that Christianity is just, just one among many ways, then they wouldn't ask about, well, what about the people who haven't heard, right? So they're advanced enough to they're know. They're advanced enough to know that, right? Yeah, so, that's good. So it's, it's oftentimes when people have asked the question we just looked at that they then ask this, well, okay, so if Jesus is the only way, well, what about the people who haven't heard yet? So, mm -hmm. um, so well, here's the first option. So the first option is to say, well, if you haven't heard, well, good for you, you're, you're in right away, yeah. right? So, but that would make a really weird dynamic if that was the case. Hmm. Because that would mean that it would be to, uh, to our advantage not to tell people about Jesus. Because if you've never heard and you automatically get in, then don't tell anybody. Let's keep it a secret. So, so your kids, don't tell your kids anything about Jesus. Because if they find out, they might reject Jesus. But if they don't know, then they're getting in. See, that's a strange dynamic, right? So, and it goes totally against Jesus' teachings, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's sort of go out. And make disciples. The Great right? Commission. So the Great Commission. So, yeah. so something's haywire with that mm -hmm. kind of option. The second option is, well, if you haven't heard too bad, you're out. Mm. Okay? And, and that one probably rubs you wrong, and I think probably ought to rub you wrong. Mm -hmm. So when we look through the scriptures, we see God as being just. Mm -hmm. Okay, So in his dealings with people. And so it would seem odd that, okay, if there's this group of people that don't even have a chance to hear, that they're just sort of booted out. Right, so mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem to go along with sort of the justice and fairness of God. So if that's the case, like it doesn't really make sense that if you, if you haven't heard, you get in, or if you haven't heard, you're out, like where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. So, well, I think the third option is this. 
See, both of those first two options assume that there are people who haven't heard. But what if we assume that everybody has heard? Okay. And I think, really, when we look at Scripture, that's what we're being told, is that everybody has been told or has heard at least enough. I think you're going to have to unpack that a little bit. (laughs) Right? So um, here's a couple of ways that God has sort of let everybody hear. Okay? So so first is through creation, right? So um, we talked about in the sort of the first week, how do we know that God exists? And and, and one of the arguments was just looking at sort of the majesty or the fine-tuning of the universe, mm-hmm. right? So Psalm um, 19 once says, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. That's right. You know. So throughout history, the vast majority of people have looked at creation and said, there's got to be something out there. And in fact, young children, even if they grow up in atheist families, the research shows, believe that there's something out there that made this universe. Mm-hmm. They actually have to be educated out of it. Mm-hmm. Right? And secular, secular educational leaders uh, prescribe just that. We need to educate this out of children. Okay? Because the intuitive sense is, this is just too marvelous for someone to mm-hmm. you know, have made it or for luck to have brought this mm-hmm. about. Okay? So, so I think the first thing that we've all heard is that there's, there's a creator. Like that's, that God has spoken that. So mm-hmm. The second thing that I think that God has revealed to all people is... A, a sense of right and wrong, okay? Hmm. So we've, we've all been given sort of this moral sense, mm-hmm. right? So we talked about this somewhat in the, in the first week, this, this sense, and they sort of, sort of, there's kind of two things that we really sort of gravitate towards, love and justice, hmm. okay? So we say that's so uncaring, it's not loving. So that's not right because it's not loving. Or we say, that's not fair. People shouldn't do that. They got that and they didn't get that. Mm -hmm. So we may disagree on what's loving and unloving or what's just and unjust. But I haven't heard anybody say, you know, justice is just a bad category altogether. Mm -hmm. Or Mm -hmm. love is a bad category altogether. Right. Both both atheists and agnostics (laughs) would (laughs) acknowledge that. They would acknowledge that. We agree that these are good standards here Mm -hmm. sort of thing. But when we look at those... And we sort of even sort of create our own sort of moral code based on what's, what's fair and what's loving. We can't even live up to our own codes. Mm-hmm. Whether they fit with God's code or not, mm-hmm. we can't live up to it. Now, if we believe there's a creator God out there mm-hmm. and there's a code that we're not living up to, then maybe that ought to have us looking for mercy. Mm-hmm. So th- here's illustration. So let's say you go to New York City, you're going to have this great weekend, you're going to see all these shows, you know, you've, you've uh, reserved way in advance this, this place, you know, this great hotel there, and you, you arrive, you know, it's so exciting, you come into the beautiful lobby of this hotel, you go to check in, and they don't have your name. Like, well, we're sorry, um, we don't have your name here, and we're completely booked. You're like, well, what are you talking about? I made this reservation a long time ago. In fact, here's even the confirmation number. We don't have that number in our system, mm. right? And they're like, you're like, well, where do I stay now? And, and My wife would not be happy. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> where, where do I stay now? And they're like, well, you don't know, because there's a lot of things going on in New York this weekend. All the hotels are probably booked. And you're just like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And let's say that somebody's in the lobby, and they sort of hear you and the distress that's going on there. And they come up to you as you sort of walk away from the sort of the check-in desk, and they say, "Hey, I've I've heard sort of this problem that you have. Um, my brother, he owns this beautiful penthouse, and he's out of town this weekend. And I actually just called him when I heard what you were going on, and he said you could stay there if you'd like. And you're a little bit skeptical at first, but like you don't have anywhere else to go, right? Mm-hmm. So you say, "Well, it's worth checking out." So you go there, and oh my goodness, it's unbelievable. It is just right over Central Park. It's just gorgeous. It's just mm. huge. I mean, everything in the, in the whole penthouse is perfectly appointed, right? And the artwork is exquisite, right? So, so you know that whoever owns this, like, they, they got a lot, right? <laughs> so, and you say, so what's the conditions? And they say, well, just leave it as you, you know, as you arrived. Found it. So just, and uh, so you go to a show that first night, and you come back, and, and you get this late-night call. It's from somebody at work. And, uh, and they tell you that this project that you've been working on, okay, 
that all the systems have gotten corrupted and all of this program and things you've been working on, it's completely lost. And in your frustration and anger, you pick up this vase that's on a table and you throw it against the wall. Okay? And you go, oh my goodness. Because you know that vase wasn't bought at Target, right? Sort of <laughs> and that piece of art there wasn't from Ikea, right? Like, sort of, like oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And you think of running at first, right? And you go, this person who owns this has got way too much resources. They'll find me out. Mm -hmm. And so based on the fact that you know that the, sort of the person who created this environment is powerful, right, sort of deal, and will hold you accountable, and based on the fact that you know that you did not sort of keep to your end of the bargain, mm -hmm. right, you decide, all I can do is cry out for mercy. And you see, God has given us creation to let us know that there's a God who made this that we're accountable to, and he's shown us that we haven't even lived up to our own moral code, let alone his, mm -hmm. so it ought to have us crying out for mercy. Mm -hmm. And what we see so often is that when people get to that point, God is just, he, he gets Jesus to them. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Sometimes even before he leaves those notes or they recognize those notes, he just shows up. Mm -hmm. So here's a story. Um, it's related by Joel Rosenberg. He's a best-selling author, um, New York Times book list and things. He's sort of an expert in Middle East affairs. And he speaks of these two Christian men who were taking Bibles into Iran. Mm -hmm. okay? And they're taking them in at night because, you know, like it was, it was a sort of a secret sort of Precarious. mission, right, to sort of deliver these Bibles to people they wanted to take them to. And suddenly as they're driving along the road, sort of in this mountainous region, their steering wheel locks and sort of goes over to the side of the road and they stop. Okay? Within moments, this old man comes knocking on the window. And the old man says, do you have the books? And they're like, what books are you talking about? The books about Jesus. Wow. And, and then he goes on and he says, I had this dream about Jesus, that he's the way. Hmm. And I told someone in my village that they had the same dream. In fact, we found out that everybody in the village had this dream about Jesus, that he's the only way. Mm -hmm. And then I had this dream that said, walk down the mountain and stand by the side of the road right here, and I'll bring you the books so you can learn more about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So do you have the books about Jesus? Like, God doesn't have a problem of getting his message to people who are ready to receive it. And we see that story after story. So often we think of sort of Muslims as being insulated from the mm. gospel. They're in the Middle East, so they never heard of Jesus. Like it can't happen. It's like it can't happen. Mm -hmm. But something between about 30, 40 percent of Muslims who turn to Christianity say they had these visceral dreams of Jesus saying mm -hmm. Jesus is the way. Mm -hmm. Like God is getting his message there. Like he's, he's not incapable of, of doing that. So so we say to ourselves, well, people haven't heard, but maybe mm -hmm. people have heard. Maybe God has left the note of creation. Maybe he has left the note of our moral conscience. Maybe he is willing to get his word into places that we even think are isolated. So, Yeah, I mean, I've <clears throat> got a couple of doctors in my family, mm -hmm. and, and they are believers. Mm -hmm. But even if they weren't, uh, most doctors I know mm -hmm. have witnessed mm -hmm they would at least acknowledge that there's something that resembles miracles <laughs> happening because people are praying for people that yeah. are sick yeah. all the time. And so if we've all kind of been privy to mm. stories like that, why couldn't God do this? That's right. Why couldn't yeah. God lock the steering wheel mm -hmm. and take the car exactly to somebody that needs to hear? Yeah. No, in fact, I, it's, I think the question about people not hearing is becoming even a mute point mm. in sort of, current days because of technology. Um, you can go to the most sort of isolated places in the world and they have cell phones. True. And if you look up anything sort of about God or Jesus, there's a, a fellow who um, about 17 years ago, I think it's about 17 years ago now, he was with Apple Computers way high up. He left Apple and he started this ministry called Global Media Outreach. And he created these websites that sort of links, you can sort of get there from all different languages. If you put in questions about God or Jesus, you're likely to end up at a global media outreach sort of attended uh, website. Mm -hmm. So in the last 17 years, they've had 2 billion people log in and ask questions about Jesus. Wow. 2 billion. 
That's one ministry, right? Mm -hmm. so, so it may have been there was a time where you could say, we could, we could make an argument, well, what about those people, how, how, how they hurt? But today I'm not so sure. There's radio, Christian radio stations in, t in mm -hmm. virtually every single That's country true. of the world. Sort of deal. So, mm -hmm. um, now one last thing I'll say in regards to this question is that if you're asking this question of well, what about the people who haven't heard, um, even if you're not satisfied with any of the answers that I gave, and you, so you just say, oh, well, I don't really know what happens to people if they haven't heard. You have to recognize that if you're asking the question, you're not one of those people who haven't heard. Mm -hmm. You have heard. So you don't really get off the hook that way, right? So you still have to deal with having heard about Jesus. What are you going to do with him? Yeah. I remember when that moment happened in my life, I had to, had to come to some resolution one way or yeah. another in my mind. So, well, uh, gosh, this has been great. I, like to I think we still have time for maybe a question okay. or two but before okay. we do that I want to make sure that people know how to stay in access to you and yeah, yeah. What, what are, what are things Absolutely. available so there's a questioninggod.com website so um, so you can even go there and uh, sort of ask questions or whatever and they get to me um, there's also there's a link on the website to podcasts there's a podcast that goes along with every single chapter of the book mm -hmm. so um, they're only about 15 minutes long, so they kind of touch on the high points. Um, but oftentimes, you know, uh, there are people maybe in your life that you can't get them to read a book, but you say, you know, I heard this one guy, and he, he sort of answered that question. You might sort of listen to this podcast, and so that's something that you can sort of point to. This last week, I was in Nashville, and I was speaking there, and this fellow, he's, he's an Aussie who's working in the United States, and he said, I grew up in a non-Christian family, um, really a non-religious family, and I came over here and I started thinking about God and um, I read your book and I decided six weeks ago to become a Christian after reading your book. And he says, my wife and I, we were driving from Dallas to Nashville and we listened to all 15 of your podcasts <laughs> sort of in that drive. So, um, so they can be a valuable help as well. Um, and then one last thing is, it, if you did get a book, I, one of the things I'd encourage you to do is just leave it out. Yeah. It's orange. It catches people's eyes. And the, the, chap, the, the title of the book is it's kind of like questioning God. Like, is that for God or against God? Right there. So, so, um, so I have many stories of people that just they leave it on their coffee table. They leave it in, the t in their office. So they leave it in their car. Even people and friends get in like, questioning God. Are you questioning God? So they, mm -hmm. And it starts conversations. So, so you can get into conversations with people by just leaving the book out <laughs> so, yeah. and seeing where it goes. And like we've said, these are, these are the most important right. questions yeah. and mm -hmm. most uh, provocative ones. Well, I think we have question time for maybe one, Oops. maybe two okay. questions. Uh, so if anybody mm -hmm. wants to come up to the mic yeah. right here and ask the question, you okay to do that? Wait, well, hang on. Let me get you on mic since we're recording this. I do. The fundamental question for me is, so why does God allow evil mm -hmm. in the first place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, you know, I mentioned one of it. I think it's the risk of real relationship. So um, if we were robotic and we didn't, uh, have a choice sort of deal, then would we really have real relationship with God? Um, I think, too, one of the things we have to remember is that um, let's say that God right now, and I've had people say this to me, they say, well, you know, I really won't, couldn't believe in God unless he got rid of all evil. And I said, do you really want that to happen? Hmm. Because if he was to get rid of the source of all evil, guess what's happening to you and me? He'd have to get rid of us too mm -hmm. because I've been the source of evil and suffering in people's lives. And sometimes we downplay sort of our evil. So, well, I never killed anybody sort of thing. Right. But what about the, right, the person on the playground when you're 9 and 10 years old and you were bowling sort of deal and they still have those voices ringing in their ears sort of deal. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they never thought of anything about themselves 
and their marriage fell apart and they became an alcoholic and they started committing crimes and there it's like oh really you didn't do anything evil right mm -hmm. when you started that whole chain going by your bowling when you were nine and ten mm -hmm. so you've all been contributors to evil and suffering if god were to get rid of it all now the source of all evils then we're gone <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so so part of it is a mercy really mm -hmm. He's giving us time to repent, yeah. to turn back to him. So, um, so I hope that we heed that call, right? So mm -hmm. that we, we realize that it is the suffering and the pain that we're going through mm -hmm. is, it's an alert. It's like we need to take care of things. So, yeah. yeah. That mercy is mm -hmm. the That's most right. important gift yeah, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. One more question. Somebody have a question? Yeah. Miss Duckett. Christian mm -hmm. campus, which is mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. But more recently in our student center, there have been tables set up. You can have a table if you're a student that says, I'm an atheist, ask me questions and try to convince me otherwise. Mm -hmm. What are questions if I were to approach mm -hmm. the table that I should ask or mm -hmm. could ask in order to kind of promote conversation, not mm -hmm. necessarily to try to be like, you know, you're worse yeah. than me and here's why kind yeah. of thing. But how do I like kind of get to where they're at and on their level? Yeah. Well, the first thing that I would ask someone is I'd say, how did you arrive at your position? When you look at sort of, sort of global statistics and even statistics in the United States, most people do believe in God. So you've chosen not to believe in God. So how did you come to your position? So um, because if I, if I understand why they believe what they believe, then I'm able to begin to sort of address the things that are important to them. If they say that it's because of science that I don't believe in God, okay, well, so then we need to have a conversation about science, right? Mm -hmm. If they say it's because, well, this happened to me when I was 10 years old and I prayed that God wouldn't let this happen and it did happen, it's like, oh, it's an evil and suffering question. So if I'm gonna sort of convince them as they're asking me to mm -hmm. sort of convince them that I need to touch on that question, right? Or if they say, you know, I think, you know, all the sort of the religious, all religion is just sort of created bad, sort of, deal. so it's just all evil sort of thing. So, okay, so I've got to address that issue sort of historically. Is that true? Or is it really true as sort of the records show that only, for example, like 7% of all wars in the last 5,000 years have had a religious motivation to them? So... So I would want to know what's the reason for their atheism because then I could then sort of address the particular thing that they think is uh, sort of worthy of, of supporting their atheism. Yeah. So John, I have a question. So I think some people might be reluctant to get into some of these mm -hmm. questions and they may still, uh, I mean the book is extremely helpful, but they might feel a little intimidated or ill-equipped to... Yeah. Uh, they feel like, well, what if they ask that question? Yeah, then I'm, yeah. I'll be sunk, That's you right. know, and yeah, so yeah. forth. But yeah. I, I think you would say from your experience that, uh, you know, it is important to learn these things and to get versed in these things. But even in those questions that you can't answer, and there are some things we're, we're quite frankly right. not going to know on this sure. side of heaven, yeah. uh, that it's still worth it to go into those conversations, mm -hmm. to admit when we don't know things, <laughs> and to trust that God is going to be in those conversations That's and even right. reveal things to us yeah. even as we're Absolutely. having those conversations. Yeah. We don't have to pretend to know more than we actually know, right? So right. we can say we don't know if someone asks us questions. But a lot of people are afraid to talk about sort of their faith in Christ because they're afraid they might get asked questions that they don't know the answer to. So let me just give you a quick little strategy, right? Sort of, it, and it's just, it's just good human behavior, right? So someone asks you a question, you don't have the answer to it. Just say, you know, that's a really good question. I want to think about that. There's no shame in that. We could ask things all the time we don't know the answer to. You just say, you know, I, I, don't, know the, I don't know the answer to that. Or I, 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 I kind of have a half answer, but I'm not so sure it's really good, so I want to think about that for a while. Now, you really honor a person when you do that, mm -hmm. right? But here's the thing is that if you say that to somebody, you need to go find an answer. And there's plenty of resources there, okay? Mm -hmm. My book, and at the end of every chapter of 
that's in the book. I, I list several other books too that you can look at. Six or seven at. books. That's right. So you can go look at some of those books, all right, and you can come up with the answer. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to the person in a couple of weeks and you say, you know that question you asked me? I've been thinking about it. Mm -hmm. They're going to be shocked. Like, really? So in a way, you've doubly honored them now. You honored mm -hmm. them the first time by telling them their question was worthy to be thought about. You've mm -hmm. honored them by coming back and actually having thought about it. Mm -hmm. And then my suggestion to you would be not to say, well, here's the answer, mm -hmm. but to say, well, here's how I've been thinking about it, and this is what I've come up with, and you tell me what you think. Mm -hmm. So you just say, well, here's what I think. So what do you think? Do you think that's weird? Do you think I'm wrong? Or do you think there's sort of another way to look at it? And now you're in a conversation, and it's friendly. It's not a, it's not a battle back and forth. It's not a debate. And uh, again, you, that means you can enter into conversation with anybody mm -hmm. and not have to know the answers at first. <laughs> yeah, and even doing that, that's not manipulation. That's Definitely. just being respectful. It's that's, just being respectful. Like you said, this is basic human kindness. Yeah, yeah that's right. Put, it, put it I mean, practice. if you're selling some product or whatever, and someone says, does this product do this? And, and you say, you know what? I'm not sure if it does. Let me get back to you. Let me talk to the people in research to see whether it finds out. Then you're going to go find that out. And then you're going to go back. Mm. And you say, that's a really good question. So, you know, here's here's what I found out. Does, does that satisfy you? Or is there other mm -hmm. things that you sort of need to know? Like that? that's just, it's just a good way to treat people. Yeah. 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 Well, you've given us so much. I, I will say that you have whetted my appetite in a big way. I, uh, the last three weeks, even, uh, even though we booked this a long time yeah, yeah. ago, uh, as I was preparing mm -hmm. to have these conversations, I mean, now I'm just, this is all I think about. So <laughs> um, I appreciate uh, how, Appreciate all the work that you put into this and then how you're continuing to, to listen to God and keep refining these answers in these conversations. So thank you for it's your time. It's been great to be here, Brett. Yeah, so really real, real pleasure. <laughs> would you mind closing us in prayer? Yeah, absolutely. I would appreciate absolutely. that. So Lord, I thank you that you um, are not scared of our questions and... Um, that you don't just say believe. You do want us to believe, but you want that belief to be grounded, Lord, in, uh, in evidence, Lord, and good reasoning. And so we thank you for that which you've given us in that regard, Lord. And uh, Lord, I know there are people here tonight that are still wondering whether you're there, whether this is all a hoax, Lord. And, and uh, so, Lord, I pray that you would in some way Help reveal yourself to them, Lord. So, or at least sort of give them the courage to ask the questions that they have, Lord. And there are those here tonight that um, uh, have just sort of sat on the fence. They're sort of in with Jesus, but not. And so I just pray, Lord, that you would sort of use some of the things that we've talked about to encourage them in their faith, Lord. And then I, I pray, too, for those who, who have friends and family who they want to share with, Lord. They're afraid, too, because they don't have sort of the answers to questions that might be asked, Lord. And I, I pray that uh, just even the last things that I just shared here now would be helpful to them and they would be able to have conversations about you with them. And we just pray all this in Christ's name. Oh, Lord, too, we just pray for the families in Uvalde tonight, mm -hmm. Lord. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, my heart goes out to them. Mm -hmm. I just cannot imagine having dropped my kids off in the morning mm -hmm. and, uh, and now... They're no longer here, Lord. So, um, so I just pray, Lord, that you would comfort them in um, ways we cannot understand. Mm. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. God bless y'all. Excellent.